let us start looking at uh, where some of these things came from. Um, the sources for the, the beliefs of these sectarian groups come from a variety of places. Obviously, we have the New Testament as a source for the groups that are mentioned, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the, um, and, and uh, some of the others. But um, remember that the New Testament is, is not an unbiased source regarding these other groups. Um, this, is, this is, you know, looking at, uh, they, they have certain attitudes and, and, and uh, presuppositions regarding Pharisees and Sadducees. Uh, and Herodians, whoever they might be, uh, and zealots. So, so we want to make sure when we are evaluating it for that purpose, we're, we're making sure and keeping a little bit of a skeptical eye on some of that. The rabbinic literature is very helpful, uh, but we need to remember that the rabbinic literature comes from the second to sixth centuries, which is obviously after the first century. And so we aren't sure, we don't want to keep that in mind as well, that that could reflect later attitudes that are being read backwards into the first century. Uh, when we consider our sources, basic historian stuff, right? We do have a first century source, the his, uh, Jewish historian uh, Flavius Josephus. We don't know how devout Josephus was exactly. Uh, he did become a Roman citizen uh, and was sort of an advocate for Jewish beliefs to the Roman Empire, uh, but he was writing to a Roman audience. And so is he skewing things um, for his audience at that point? How, how unbiased a, a reporter is he on that as well? Uh, but these are sort of the primary sources that we have, have for these individual groups. Josephus mentioned four major Jewish sectarian groups in the first centuries. The Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Essenes, and the Zealots. And so we're going to look at those as well as, as uh, a couple of others as we go through it. So um, probably these groups developed as a result of the Hasmonean period. The Hasmonean period is the name given to that 100 years of Jewish self-rule um, after Judas the Maccabee freed Jerusalem all the way down till they lost, um, or till they ended up being conquered by the Romans. So that, how you reacted toward that was, was probably, as I mentioned last week, what gave rise to some of, these, some of these groups. Because as they lost their religious ideals, remember initially it was all in opposition to Antiochus IV Epiphanes. He was the main big bad. And so he's auctioning off the high priest. He's trying to force Hellenism on the Jews. Well, once the, once the, the uh, Maccabean revolt is successful, and the, the brothers Maccabee end up, you know, having their turns as king, the ones that don't get crushed by elephants. Um, then the, the question is, do you accept that? I mean, they're not Zadokite high priests, and, um, and so how do you respond to this, you know, losing those ideals initially? Yeah. But the three ways you can respond to that loss of idealism is just accept it. You know what? It's better than having a Greek high priest. We'll, we'll go ahead and just accept it. Um, you could oppose it and say, no, no, we need to hold on to these ideals. Or you can just withdraw from the situation and leave. And, and this is a gross oversimplification, but it does sort of explain kind of the origins of some of our sectarian groups. The, the, Sadducee, the Sadducees um, tend to accept it. They, they tend to be more Hellenistic um, and be willing to accept a little more, uh, you know what, better than nothing. Um, the Pharisees tended to oppose, and, and the Essenes uh, certainly withdrew. So we'll, we'll start with the Sadducees. Um, they're the, the first place to go to. Um, they're often placed in opposition to the Pharisees. They are probably the two most prominent groups in Jerusalem. Uh, they are the two most prominent groups in Jerusalem. Uh, they are very close to the aristocracy in Jerusalem. They're usually thought of as a priestly aristocracy. Um, they, they had control of, connected to the temple, um, they were the sophisticated urban class in Jerusalem. They're the upper class. I mean, they're the ones who have the most to lose as a result of any military insurrection. They're, they're most invested in the status quo. And uh, uh, they, I, I do love, I saw this quote once in a book, and I don't know where I found the original source, but I liked it. They combined conservative religious attitudes with power politics uh, to maintain their, their control. There was a little claymation Easter movie years ago called... Um, no, that's not claymation. So <laughs> Veggie close. Tales is not claymation. It was called uh, The Miracle Maker. That was it. It's called The Miracle Maker. And um, it is one of the few passion movies. Uh, obviously, it was skewed for children, but it's one of the few passion movies that actually blamed much of Passion Week on Sadducean threat to Jesus rather than Pharisee. Most of the movies take sort of a, a Pharisaic, oh, it's the Pharisees that are responsible for crucifixion. But that one actually um, portrayed the Sadducees as being the ones sort of behind Jesus' arrest and, and, uh, and crucifixion, which 
makes more sense sort of politically because they had the most to lose um, from Jesus's message. Um, <laughs> Jim Halverson, my former colleague, always liked to say that uh, the people who were responsible for Jesus, most responsible for Jesus's death were the ones who truly understood his message. Um, if this guy's right, we're going to have to kill him. Uh, that can't happen. So, so they, are, they are at the top. So what were their religious beliefs? Well, they were very simple, really. Uh, they only recognize Torah as scripture. That's Genesis to Deuteronomy. That is the only Bible for them. Is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So only theological beliefs that are able to be interpreted from the Torah are the beliefs you hold on to. Um, that's it. They rejected the oral tradition. We'll talk about the oral tradition in just a little bit. Um, they tended to, again, be very basic readers of the text, very simple readers of the text. In other words, when uh, the Bible says you, you should not cook a goat in its mother's milk, um, they thought that meant you shouldn't cook a goat in its mother's milk. Um, so don't bake any uh, baby goats in the mother goat's milk. That's, that's what it says. I mean, there are, you know, Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it kind of folks here. Very literal. Very, very literal. Very literal. We're going to see the Pharisees were not in that way. Um, now, of course, that scripture was written at a time when apparently that was a Canaanite practice, and that was a way in which of showing commitment to, to God. By the time we get into the first century, there, that wasn't a practice that, I mean, that wasn't a menu item anyplace. So it, it, was, it was not, it, it didn't necessarily affect belief in any way. Yeah. They did not believe the soul existed after death. They believed you died, uh, which is interesting because they were very, they, they tended to be okay with Hellenism, which, of course, believed in an immortal soul, but that's something they reject. No, because you can't, don't have that in the Torah. There's no resurrection. There's no uh, afterlife. There's no soul. I mean, Genesis, Deuteronomy, pretty simple, which, by the way, we'll talk about the genius of Jesus on this. Some of you remember during Passion Week, a group of Sadducees came to him to, tr to ask him a question, and they said that this woman gets married seven times. She's widowed all these times. Whose wife is she in the resurrection? Well, the Sadducees are asking the question, whose wife is she in the resurrection? Which is already, you know, you know this is a test and doesn't make any sense. So Jesus responds with a quote from Exodus when God says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, showing that they were alive, that that, that was sort of a good rabbinical argument from Jesus' perspective. But he quotes from Torah to prove resurrection back to the Sadducees when he does it, which does because... I mean, that's hitting him right where it hurts on that. He didn't go to Daniel, which we saw last week. He goes to, to the, which is pretty clever. So, so yeah, very, very literal in their reading. The most to lose from the status quo changing. And we're going to see most of these groups, it's, it's how you respond to these different questions here, are, are all revolving around these five questions in some ways of how they believe what, what changes. Not really messianic. Don't need to. Things are fine for them. That's kind of realized eschatology. Everything's going well. We're, we're looking forward to. They accepted Roman rule, accepted Hellenism. Uh, the Pharisees. Josephus says they were very influential among the people. And, and I think part of the reason is they were doing what they could to make Torah relevant to the common person. That they were a, a blue-collar religious group in a lot of ways. I know we tend to think of Pharisees as elite and leadership and ruling class, but that's the Sadducees. Pharisees, much more among the people. And, and really, I think, trying to make Torah relevant. Um, they had two sources of authority in equal measure. Uh, the Torah, the written law that's given by Moses that we know is Genesis to Deuteronomy, or actually which is Exodus 20 all the way to, to the end of, what, Leviticus. Um, but they also had the oral Torah. Now, the oral Torah was what they said was the interpretation of the Torah that God gave to Moses that had been passed down over time. And that oral interpretation of Torah, in their mind, was as authoritative as Torah itself. So now, where the Torah says, don't eat a baby goat cooked in its mother's milk, the oral Torah says, so what that means is, don't eat dairy and meat at the same meal. Because you can't guarantee that the animal that made the hamburger wasn't the child of the cow that gave the milk that made the cheese. And so in an effort to avoid that circumstance, that's really what that meant. So whereas the Sadducees are like, don't eat a goat cooked in his mother's milk, not a problem. Um, doesn't bother me. If I tell you don't eat meat and dairy at the same meal, it's like, okay, now it affects the way in which I live each day. So what I think the oral Torah was intended to do was to make the law more relevant and make, give people an opportunity to actually show divine instruction. Of course, 
it becomes oppressive. It becomes a tool by which, I mean, people could, sh and, and I should point out, the oppressive interpreters of oral Torah that were placing restrictions on the common people are condemned in rabbinic literature as they are condemned by Jesus as well. I mean, it, it's, this is not a, that, that is something I think we need to point out, that, that it is not, I, I'm not being pejorative in this interpretation in any way. I mean, the, 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 the rabbis came down on the people doing it hard as well. I mean, even though fair sake Judaism is the Judaism that's the precursor to rabbinic Judaism, they would say that the people who were using it as a, as a hammer weren't getting it right. I mean, the rabbis did in the Mishnah and the Talmud as well as today. They would agree with Jesus on, hey, you can't do that to people. That's what I'm trying to say. Didn't have that real elegant, but I think I, I, think I made my point. <laughs> so, so what do they believe as a result of, of these two sources of authority? Well, they accepted Torah, prophets, and writings as scripture. Um, so what we recognize as uh, Old Testament, um, law, prophets, writings, Pharisees recognize that. They believe the righteous were resurrected after death. By the way, this point is one that changed Paul's life. Because Paul, Pharisee of Pharisees, witnessed a resurrected Jesus on the road to Damascus. That moment, coming from this theological perspective, changes everything. Because if Jesus has been resurrected, then he was righteous. Yeah, so... Everything Paul knows is wrong, down is up, up is down, and, and it changes his life forever. And so much of his theology grows out of trying to wrestle with that scandal on of Christ crucified, the righteous one crucified. How do you make sense of that? Uh, they tended to be a little more apocalyptic and accepted angels and demons, again, because of the writings, acceptance as, as, uh, as Torah. Um, they wanted people to be a priestly people, and, uh, and so they wanted people to be holy. They, they felt that the Levitical rules for holiness for priests should apply to everyone because we need to be a priestly people. So, so you need to follow dietary restrictions and, and cleanliness restrictions and, and all of those things. Um, but of course, that, that meant that this was a, a dynamic and, and, and growing force. You, you, know, you could not point to a scripture, and you still can't. I mean, you cannot point to an Old Testament scripture and says, see, the Bible says this, so that means. Because the Pharisees and later rabbinic Judaism, there's a, a long tradition of interpretation that has authority along with what that original scripture says at the same time. It is, it is growing and interpreting in every social situation in the way you go. So that's, that's different, uh, the, less the literalist than the others were. Um, Jesus obviously had a lot of theological agreement with the Pharisees. Um, he quotes from every section of the Old Testament that we know, law, prophets, writings. Obviously, Jesus believes in resurrection. I shouldn't have to say that, but it's probably worth mentioning. Kind of important. Um, both of them believe that table fellowship corresponded to temple theology. Now, they drew different conclusions based on that belief. The, they, the, the Pharisaic belief was that temple fellowship mirrored, excuse me, table fellowship mirrored temple theology, so that meant the table needed to be pure and holy, and, and you need to only come to the table if you're pure, pure and holy, and so the sinful are kept away. Jesus says, yes, absolutely. Table is the same as temple, so everybody's welcome. Uh, so he undoes that, but they come from the same perspective. And many of Jesus' teachings have parallels in the rabbinic literature from the first century. Two that are worth mentioning, uh, the liberal and the conservative rabbi. Um, rabbi Hillel said, what is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow man. That is the entire law. All the rest is commentary, uh, which sounds a whole lot like love your neighbor as yourself, only the negative statement of that, I guess. Uh, and divorce is only permitted for adultery was Rabbi Shammai, uh, which is exactly what Jesus says in Matthew 5. So um, it is, these are two, op Rabbi Hillel allowed you to um, divorce if your wife burned the breakfast. That was okay. Um, so he was not a women's rights guy. Uh, but Shammai, much more conservative about divorce. It sounds a lot more like Jesus there. So, so in keeping with his time, I guess, in many ways. All right. Essenes. Essenes are not mentioned in the New Testament, which is odd because Josephus says that they make up as large a number as the Pharisees in the first century. Um, and so you would think they would be mentioned. I say probably not mentioned in the first century uh, because there is a, and I will confess, minority opinion of which I am a part. <laughs> and my former uh, podcast partner, Mike McKeever, uh, does, is not a part. Um, that the New Testament mention of the Herodians actually corresponds to the Essenes. Um, that 
the Essenes are, were known at, in the first century as the Herodians. Uh, this was an interpretation first put forward by um, Yagel Yadin, I believe, a Dead Sea Scroll scholar, and uh, I was convinced by him. Uh, other people are not, but I, I think there's something to it. One of the reasons, and I realize this comes from a lot of presuppositions, assuming that the settlement at Qumran are Essenes, which is an assumption, um, the Qumran settlement was not occupied during Herod's reign. Herod was himself Edomian, an Edomite, uh, not Jewish, and so not particularly welcomed by Jewish ruling establishment in Jerusalem. And so the assumption is that he latched onto the outcast religious group out in the desert and gave preferential, preferential treatment. It is, a, it is a possible interpretation. We don't know anything about Herodians other than that. That's why it's, it's kind of confusing. So um, I'm willing to think of the Essenes as possibly Herodian. Essenes also get some press because John the Baptist uh, does seem to be preaching in their area and has some ideas that are similar to them. Um, also, there's, I, I saw an interpretation that possibly um, Jesus had some Essene friends because he tells the disciples when they go into Jerusalem uh, to make the arrangements for the upper room for the Last Supper, he says, you'll see a man drawing water. And uh, traditionally, Essenes were a monastic community, uh, celibate, and mostly men. And so whereas often women would be drawing water, to see a man drawing water would be an unusual thing, and, and that's the code they set up ahead of time. Maybe. All of that is supposition, but it's possible. Wow, it is. It's a lot. It's a lot, but it's possible. Um, the Essenes, a lot in common with the Pharisees, uh, Torah prophets writings, and um, the and assumes the Dead Sea Scroll settlement are Essenes. So we'll talk about the and in a second. Yeah. Yes, the Essenes were absolutely contemporaneous with the early first century, and um, but the only... Jewish sectarian group to survive the first century were, was the Pharisaic uh, interpretation. Um, the Samaritans survived as well, though we wouldn't call them Jewish. Um, the, the Pharisees were the only ones whose faith was nimble enough to survive the destruction of the temple. Um, Sadducees had it tied to the temple. Uh, the Essenes were in the desert and basically were exterminated in the first Jewish war. And so what you're left with is, is the Pharisaic tradition and Christianity the other Jewish tradition that came out of the first century. So um, the, uh, the plus, in 1948, the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, and they, they changed a lot. They, they, we had older copies of uh, Old Testament manuscripts by a 1,000 years earlier, than, the older than we had had previously, a, a Isaiah scroll and Psalm scroll dating to 200 BC uh, at that point. Um, prior to that, it's the Aleppo Codex from 800. Um, so I mean, it's a thousand years earlier. They found three different types of manuscript at uh, Qumran. They found text we knew, uh, canonical text, Genesis to Malachi, um, or Genesis Second Chronicles, if we follow the Hebrew canon. Um, they didn't find any Esther, which probably isn't surprising, as it doesn't mention God. Uh, they also found apocryphal and pseudepigraphical works that we knew about from other sources. Um, Maccabees and, and, and the like. But they also found a third category, which was previously unknown documents. And among them, the War Scroll, the Copper Scroll, um, and the, the founding document talked about the teacher of righteousness who led these people and will lead this ultimate fight against the teachers of darkness. Um, so many assume that this is a sort of apocalyptic telling of the founder of the group, the teacher of righteousness, who, who is, is they, they were very messianic. In fact, they were sort of doubly messianic. We'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, so that the teacher of righteousness was, a, was an authority figure for them. They did not follow oral Torah, but they did believe in uh, inspired exegesis. So they, they while they didn't follow the, that, that co co no, that's not Jesus with a, with a G, Jesus. Oh, exegesis okay. is interpretation. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so to, bring, to bring meaning out of uh, exegesis. Um, the... Uh, they believed, so, so they, they were creative with their readings, but they didn't have any formal codified oral Torah like we have with the Pharisees. They rejected the Jerusalem priesthood in the temple. So these are the ones that would, withdrew. Um, they lived in the wilderness, the desert area, right? Uh, the Qumran um, site is right at the northern tip of the Dead Sea. So just, just south, I should say, okay, Jericho's in the northern tip. Qumran's just a little bit down from there. But it's just south of where John was baptizing. 
I mean, just right south of where John was baptizing. Uh, from their founding documents, there was a three-year period of initiation. For the first year, you would uh, follow but not live in the community. You could not live in the desert. You, had, you could follow it. Um, and the second and third years, a novice would live with them, but you couldn't eat with them. And then after four years, you could actually be part of the community. Very strict obedience to the elders. Very strict obedience to cleanliness. Um, you could not, for example, you could not defecate within the community. So you had to leave the, the community to get outside, which is fine if you're a practic practicing Essene in a small monastic community in the desert. If you're an Essene who lives in the center of Jerusalem, I think that the, any digestive issues would make that issue far more urgent and makes us wonder if perhaps that's where the dumb gate gets its name. We don't know for sure, but it's, you know, possible. Anyway, um, gesticulating wildly with your left hand could render you censured from the community. Uh, moving your arm and, and uncovering your, yourself with your robe could get you censured by the community. Um, one of the problems that we have with the uh, associating this community with necessarily with Essenes is the graves that were found nearby that had been excavated found um, primarily men, but some women. And so how does that work? I mean, because Essenes typically were all boys or supposed to be all boys. Um, so don't know. Did they have a sister monastery? I don't know how that works. Uh, they believed in communal property, celibacy, daily work. They were farmers, shepherds, beekeepers, craftsmen, etc. Uh, very ritualistic. Purity was absolutely essential. Very apocalyptic. Um, they had strong genealogies of angels, and uh, which I didn't even know you could do, where they came from. Um, they believed in bodily resurrection in the same way. Uh, they believed in ultimate judgment on Jerusalem before God's going to come and set it up. They, they actually believed in two messiahs. They believed in a military uh, kingly messiah who comes from the line of David, and they believed in a priestly messiah who would come from the line of Aaron uh, to fix the priesthood. So one group to fix up the kingship and one group to fix up the priesthood. So two messiahs coming from the Essenes' perspective. Uh, let's talk about the Samaritans. Not exactly a Jewish sectarian group, but certainly one that has a lot of overlap with, with our group in our first century. Um, Jerusalem and Mount Zion are special to all of the Jewish faith. Either, either they work there and they're Sadducees, they're not happy with who's there and they're Pharisees, um, they're ready for all of them to disappear in their Essenes. Samaritans, totally different. Samaritans believed that Mount Gerizim was the holy mountain, uh, which is just north of Jerusalem, and Shechem is actually the holy city. Shechem, what is probably the second most important city in the Old Testament. So the... the I remember we talked about in the Old Testament that when the Assyrians exiled people, they spread them all throughout the empire and spread other people there to try and breed out the problem. That way people don't hold on to their ethnic identity. They aren't going to rebel because they can't organize. And so the, the traditional interpretation of Samaritans are they are the offspring of, of that destruction back in 722. They saw themselves as offspring of the northern tribes, keepers of the promise, chosen people, holy by God. Um, and the returning exiles in 580, in five, uh, from the 586 exile, the, the Jewish, the Judah exile, saw them as descendants of the conquered peoples, and opening themselves up to that kind of exposure would uh, corrupt faith like it did before, and so they, ex they, they completely separated themselves off from it and saw them as a separate group. So they didn't want their help building the temple in Ezra uh, 4. So much enmity between the two groups, um, debates from each of the others over which ones even had souls. I mean, there, that was a question, whether Sh Samaritans could even have souls in this. Uh, no such thing as a good Samaritan from a Jewish perspective. Uh, they, uh, same as Jewish faith, uncompromising belief in the worship of one God, no idolatry. Um, they, were, they were strict monotheists. They believed in the law of Moses. They followed Torah. Uh, they believed they were the chosen people promised by God, for the, for the holy land of Israel and had an expectation of Messiah. So you see a lot of overlap here uh, with this. Uh, some differences. Um, they built the rival temple on Mount Gerizim, which was destroyed in 100 BC by John Hyrcanus, who was one of the Maccabean descendants, one of the Hasmonean kings. Um, so when the Samaritan woman says to Jesus, our ancestors worship on that mountain. She's pointing to Mount Gerizim when she says that. We can't see her pointing in the text, but that's what she's pointing to. And, and it's less, you know, it's a it's hundred years before that a Jewish king destroyed their temple. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's the context for that conversation there. 
Uh, they obviously rejected the Jerusalem priesthood. They had their own. Um, they did recognize only the Torah as scripture, but it was the, what's called the Samaritan Pentateuch. Um, it's basically the same as the standard Jewish Pentateuch, except there are a couple of places that are changed that give a little primacy to Mount Gerizim uh, as a special place, um, sort of alluded to in there. Um, and obviously they rejected that resurrection because they just had Torah, same as the Sadducees. So that's where that comes from. And up until the 20th century, there were still Samaritans around that were still sacrificing animals on Passover. And there are a few around now, but they number in the dozens as opposed to the hundreds, uh, which happens over time. Zealots. This is the fourth group of Josephus, which we never get a clear, are they truly an independent group or not? Um, not clear exactly how religious this group is. They mainly were extreme nationalists. They wanted uh, Jewish self-rule. They wanted Israel to be self-rule. They forbid paying taxes to Rome. They believed that an armed rebellion was the answer to everything. Um, sometimes... I think Josephus says they believe that God would favor them if they had an armed rebellion. So, again, are they religious? Maybe. Um, they may have been an extremist group of the Pharisees, but that, like, the religion doesn't come up much. It's mainly down with Rome. <laughs> there were a group of assassins, zealous assassins, known as Sicarii. Uh, they were known for their ability to you know, sneak up and kill folks, as assassins do. Uh, to be assassins, um, are that's, that's one of the, one of the tests you know, on that. If you want to kill folks, no. Well, I'm afraid you failed the test. Um, it has been suggested, again, talk about sketchy, but it's possible that the Sicarii does have an etymological connection to one of Jesus' disciples. You might recall Judas Iscariot um, may have been one of these zealots, may have been one of these uh, extreme nationalists, which might explain part of his attitude at the end of the day, that he's wanting to throw off, you know, he's, he's ready to call Jesus to come out to start that rebellion that everybody was wanting, perhaps. I mean, if that, that's motivating much of Judas's decision-making. Very possible, I think. Um, more sympathetic reason, reading of Judas there. So I don't have much to say about zealots because we don't know much other than the fact that they hated Rome. Um, the scribes do seem to be most associated with the Pharisees. Uh, it's always the scribes and Pharisees in the New Testament, uh, so it's not clear whether or not that's, I mean, there probably were other groups who had copies. I assume the Sadducees needed copies of their own uh, Torah, but we don't hear them talk about it. No one ever says, oh, so along came the scribes and the Sadducees. They never do that. It's always the scribes and the Pharisees. So, but, it, you know. God says he's going to shoot him an email. Yeah, shoot, shoot, reset an email and, and tell him to copy me back if he re on his response. So, uh, Let's talk about messianism. This is something that most of the groups um, shared on, to some degree. I mean, the Sadducees, not so much because, you know, they didn't need life to in, get in the way of their realized eschatology. Um, but the Essenes, the Pharisees, um, the Zealots a little bit because they were wanting that military uh, takeover. The Samaritans had this expectation. It is funny to me, the Sadducees were not Messianic because everything's going real well, but they only had the Torah. The Samaritans were Messianic even though they only had the Torah, but things weren't going real well. They needed, they needed that hope of a coming anointed one. Um, the expectation of a coming anointed person, which by the way is just what Messiah means, anointed, it's the Hebrew word Masiach, the Greek word Christos. Um, Christ is not Jesus' last name. It's Jesus the anointed is what that means. Um, they believe in this coming person who's going to redeem Israel. Uh, usually this person is representing the climax of history. Normally it's eschatological. I don't know with the zealots if it would be. Um, it might be. Maybe the zealots just wanted a human king to come and set up a new kingdom. I don't know. But usually it's eschatological. And just as a reminder, eschatology means the end times. That's all eschatology means. Um, the term Messiah originates, as I say, in the Old Testament. It was used about kings. It was used about priests. It was used about prophets. Anyone who is anointed by God. If you see the word anointed in the Old Testament, it is Messiah. It's Messiah. Um, which, interesting uh, sidebar here real quick. Um, Psalm 2 uh, why do the nations rage? Why do they plot and scheme against God and his anointed one? When that's written, very likely just referring to the king on the throne in Jerusalem. When the Old Testament is translated into Greek, now all of a sudden, all those early Christians read, why do the nations rage against God and his Christ? Uh, his Christos. It, it is an instant, instant allegory happens at that moment. Okay. Um, couple of different ways to look at this, though. I've got a couple of passages. The first I'll start with is in Daniel. Uh, 
um, as I continue, this is Daniel 7. As I continued to watch, excuse me, as I continued to watch this night vision of mine, I suddenly saw one like a human being in Hebrew, um, B'nai Adam, a son of man. Okay, son of man. Coming with the heavenly clouds, he came to the ancient one and was presented before him. Rule, glory, and kingship were given to him. All peoples, nations, languages will serve him. His rule is an everlasting one. It will never pass away. His kingship's indestructible. So a son of man floating on the clouds, coming down to rule correctly. Son of man here, it seems to be more than a human being. It's one like a human being. Um, there seems to be a divine expectation of that kind of idea. Son of man, remember that word we saw in Ezekiel just means human being. It just means, hey, human. As opposed, it's all God ever called Ezekiel. Hey, human. As opposed to, hey, table. Um, to distinguish him from idols at the time. Because we're human beings, the only legitimate idols in the world, you will remember. Now I've got Tarzan so, going through my head. You're welcome. <laughs> Tarzan songs going through your head. Thank you, Phil Collins. Um, but you see here, this son of man is not just, hey, human being. This is big time semi-divine human being coming on clouds. Well, this, I told you Daniel, probably the latest of our Old Testament books to be written down. In the intertestamental period, there was this messian, growing messianic expectation. You know, when you're under the control of the, of the Persians, you're under control of the, of the Greeks. Um, you, you get this, this even when you're, the, when you're a Pharisee who doesn't like what the Maccabeans, or the, the Hasmoneans are doing, you get this hope for a coming holy person that's going to set this up. And so some of our other intertestamental texts, just because we don't have them in the canon doesn't mean people weren't writing. In fact, people were writing like crazy. And we've got a couple, I want a couple of, of examples of these uh, pseudepigraphical and, and uh, apocryphal texts that have this view of the divine sounding son of man. The first comes from uh, 1 Enoch 46, um, named after Enoch of the biblical text. See, when, when the Bible doesn't say much about people, you can have all sorts of fun with them. Uh, so the less the Bible says, the more money you can make off stuff. I, I offer, for an example, the prayer of Jabez, for example. Um, First Enoch 46 says, There I beheld the Ancient of Days, that's God, whose head was like white wool, and with him another, whose countenance resembled that of a man. His countenance was full of grace, like that of one of the holy angels. Then I inquired of one of the angels who went with me and who showed me every secret thing concerning the Son of Man, who he was, whence he was, and why he accompanied the Ancient of Days. Why is that dude hanging out with God? He looks great. <laughs> he answered and said to me, This is the Son of Man to whom righteousness belongs, with whom righteousness has dwelt, and who will reveal all the treasures of, of that which is concealed. For the Lord of Spirits has chosen him, and his portion has surpassed all before the Lord of Spirits in everlasting uprightness. So again, this son of man, somebody who hangs out with God and is going to bring righteousness and perfect rule. And so this is beyond human being, this phrase, son of man, here. Uh, by the way, First Enoch, really interesting book. Um, my former colleague, Eric Mason, has done a lot of work in, in this time period and a lot of work in First Enoch. Um, and I should say that I, I meant to look it up before we, we started. I mentioned it. A few years ago, the movie uh, Noah that came out with Russell Crowe and Emma Watson, and I can't remember who directed that. Um, I want to say Ridley Scott, but that's not right, I'm sure. Anyway, whoever that movie, most of the reviews I heard of that movie from biblical scholars who went, I actually have never seen it, because if I don't see it, then when people ask me what I think, I can say, oh, sorry, I haven't seen it. So that's what I do. I make that choice intentionally. Uh, on that. I felt like it, but I'm reporting what someone else has said, um, that that uh, movie was a lousy adaptation of the book of Genesis, but a really good adaptation of the book of Enoch. Uh, so, Darren, oh, oh, Darren Aronofsky. Yeah, Darren Aronofsky. That's who it was. Uh, Darren Aronofsky's adaptation of Noah uh, was a really bad adaptation from Genesis, but really good adaptation of, of Enoch. Lots of crazy things happening in Enoch. So if you're looking for a crazy and intertestamental book, that's the one for you. Um, one other intertestamental book, 4th Ezra, chapter 13. After seven days, I dreamed a dream of days gone by in the night. And behold, a wind arose from the sea and stirred up all its waves. And I looked, and behold, this wind made something like a figure of a man come up out of the heart of the sea. Well, this is crazy. The wind blew a dude out of the sea. Um, that's not something you see all the time. Cindy is now singing Les Mis. And I looked, and behold, the man flew with the clouds of heaven. And wherever he turned his face to look, everything under his gaze trembled. And whatever his voice issued from his mouth, all who heard his voice melted as wax melts when it feels the fire. That is not just a dude. Um, a guy who gets blown out of the sea and can melt people with his gaze. Uh, is, that's quite a son of man that we have going on here. Um, so...
Um, so that gives us very divine pictures. However, Psalms of Solomon, which are some other intertestamental uh, psalms, and some Dead Sea Scrolls emphasize a more human military messiah, someone who's born of a woman, who leads a you know, charismatic leader empowered by God, frees Rome, gets us back on our feet, and then sets up a loyal kingship that then endures for generations as he dies, as a more human kind of life, someone who will rescue the Jews from Gentile oppression. This is also an expectation in the first century. Um, Qumran, as I said, had two messiahs, one that was descended from David, who was that earthly priestly messiah, and one who's descended from Aaron, who, who excuse me, is the earthly royal messiah, and one from Aaron, who's a priestly messiah, who can fix the temple, because they didn't want one guy to fix both. The king does the king stuff, the priest does the priest stuff, so we need two messiahs for that. The, the whole king uh, and priest thing was what got us in trouble with Jonathan back in the Maccabees to begin with, so frankly, the Essenes make a lot of sense at Qumran, frankly. It makes a whole lot. Um, by the way, well, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, so where does Jesus fit into all of this? Well, Jesus, his favorite title for himself, son of man. So what did Jesus mean? Did Jesus mean, hey, human being, just like you guys, here we are. Did Jesus mean Daniel 7, that coming in the clouds, that gaze that made all the world tremble, the, the, that great looking guy that always hangs out with God? I mean, <laughs> what, what is exactly meant? And I think the answer is probably yes. That, that there is that invoking of that human notion and messianic expectation, but there's also that divine quality that as well, that is going all into that term. It is a term pregnant with meaning and interpretation when it's being used. It is a, it is a political term. It is not a, in any way an, an apolitical assertion to call himself son of man. Uh, so, you know, Jesus, you don't have that, hey, you know what? I'm the son of God, Messiah. That's who I am. We're divine. Let me give you a Trinitarian formula so you understand. You don't get that. You get functional statements of Trinity, and you get these illusions that, that the, the audience that received this would have no problem seeing. But, of course, we, we don't see just how pregnant that term is uh, when it comes through like that. Hebrews, I think, another favorite of Eric Mason, seems to pick up on the priestly messianism. Jesus is a high priest in the order of Melchizedek, that mysterious Old Testament figure, uh, and connected, of course, to, to David. He's the son of David. And we have all sorts of um, that high priest who understands us. That comes from the book of Hebrews as well. So I think Hebrews is picking up on that Qumran priestly messiah, as well as the son of David, which you get son of David, something people call uh, Jesus in, say, Mark, Bar Bartimaeus calls him son of David, which, of course, is a messianic uh, term as well as son of man. So all of this is in this, this conversation. So 